Okay, well, welcome back. And for those of you who were not here before, then I guess it's not welcome back, welcome. For those of you who just had lunch, enjoy your nap. <laughs> I will not be offended. I will call on you while you're sleeping, but that'll be okay. Uh, so again, if you have any, we're going to talk about hyperthyroidism first, uh, then branch into cat adrenal, and then finish with dog hypo, because it's the most confusing thing, and I don't like to talk about it. So we'll do that last. Um, any of the, if you have any questions about anything after the meeting, you can certainly email me at that address. Um, and again, all these uh, slides and things are on uh, the website there. So what we're going to, we're going to talk about hyperthyroidism. Um, the main things I think that we want to cover is we're going to talk about normal stuff and we're going to talk about the food, about YD, mainly because um, we're involved in some studies with the food. Uh, but before we talk about the food, I should just tell you that I don't work for Hills. Um, we do use lots of flimazole. We have an I-131 facility, um, so we treat a lot of hyperthyroid cats. Um, we treated nine cats this week. We haven't seen any fall off in our I-131 uh, facility, so, so life is good in that regard. Um, I'm not a nutritionist. If you were here for the diabetes, that was painfully obvious. I am going to talk about uh, the role of nutrition, especially protein, uh, when we talk about hyperthyroidism and azotemia and uh, lean body mass later. Uh, we do see a ton of hyperthyroid cats, which is good. And also, if you were here yesterday, that we are working actively to ban all pet owners from the Internet. So, um, and especially with, with uh, this particular thing, I mean, you see a lot of weird stuff, but some of the stuff uh, out there about uh, the food is just like, I don't know, it's like crazy. But again, that's just the reality. So with the food, what we were interested in is uh, the way the food sort of came about, if you don't know the history, is probably about 11 years ago now. Uh, Ray Nockreiner, who's an endocrinologist, PhD dude at Michigan State, was sitting around at a meeting talking with the nutritionist uh, from Hills saying, you know, if you want to get rid of hyperthyroidism in cats, just restrict the amount of iodine in the food because you need iodine to make thyroid hormone. If you give them less iodine, they won't be able to make the hormone, therefore will be able to lower their total T4s. Now, that's the story he tells. The story I tell is that they were sitting around in a bar, getting drunk, writing on cocktail napkins. None of this happened, by the way. Um, and the Hills people went back to the Hills facility in Kansas and said, look, you know, why don't we make a diet that's iodine restricted um, and see what we can do with that. And then all the manufacturing people said, you got to be out of your freaking mind because it's going to be virtually impossible to make a food that has a consistent iodine concentration because we're using all these different sources of ingredients. So we're going to have to get known sources of ingredients with known iodine concentrations. We're going to have to make it in a separate facility. And so it only took them 10 years to sort out the whole thing about how to even make the food. And so what we're going to do is, is kind of look at the questions surrounding what is the efficacy uh, in newly diagnosed cats, uh, both in terms of making them euthyroid uh, clinically and biochemically. Uh, what about cats that are not doing well on oral topical tapazole and you want to switch? What effects, if any, does it have on renal function? Because we know that all the other treatments that we have, surgery, radioactive iodine, uh, oral topical, antithyroid medications, have adverse effects uh, or potential adverse effects on renal function. What about body weight? Uh, and lean body mass uh, when they're taking in this diet? Um, and then what, if any, are the long-term effects of iodine restriction? And so the first thing that I think that we need to understand is that it's an iodine-restricted diet. It's not an iodine-deficient diet. And so one of the things that they first had to figure out, and we'll go through this, is uh, what is the minimum iodine requirement uh, for the cat? So first of all, we'll just go back and review some stuff about what we do know. Uh, there's been a lot of good studies now on uh, pathogenesis, so we'll review some of that. Uh, clinical signs, um, she was talking about that slide being, oh, you don't need diagnostics when you see a cat like that, uh, which is true, but we don't see cats like that anymore. Uh, most of the cats that we see now are, are actually much more subtle in their symptoms. Talk about testing, uh, thyroid function testing, go through the options, talk about the food, talk about the whole issue of renal disease and hyperthyroidism and how we try and manage uh, both. And then talk about what, for us in the lab, is the most rapidly expanding uh, segment of the hyperthyroid cat population. And those are cats with high total T4s who are normal. 
uh, clinically normal, that you found them by accident basically because you were doing a screening test. So first of all, with respect to etiology, there's been uh, four or five fairly large uh, studies trying to look at the epidemiology of this disease. And there's a lot of things we do know. We do know that the disease did not exist in the United States prior to 1979. And we know it didn't exist because there were large veterinary centers like AMC and Angel Memorial that always did very thorough necropsies on all the cats that died. And so we had thyroid histopath and thyroid weights on cats up to 1979. No one was seeing hyperplastic thyroids, thyroid nodules, uh, or anything like that prior to that. What sort of happened in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, was that there was sort of a switch between what cats were being fed. And so cats were being transitioned from uh, eating dog food and human-based foods to more traditionally uh, eating cat foods made specifically for cats. And the manufacturing of commercial cat foods became much more uh, mechanized. And then you saw the disease first show up in papers from New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and then start to spread throughout the country uh, out to California. And now the disease is pretty much everywhere in the United States and Canada. It didn't used to be in places like Southeast Asia and Japan, Australia, New Zealand, but it's there now. And you can pretty much follow the rise of hyperthyroidism uh, in those countries with the advent of movement of commercial cat foods into those countries. So there's definitely a linkage between uh, dietary factors. Uh, so diet's been looked at, genetic factors, and environmental factors. Genetically, we know that um, these cats, if we take thyroid tissue out of hyperthyroid cats and compare it to thyroid tissue from non-hyperthyroid cats, there's a decreased expression of gene inhibitory proteins and overexpression of an oncogene CRAS. So what we think happens is that as the cat population gets older, these mutations are present, which basically allow for thyroid proliferation. And you guys see this all the time because you see cats that come into your practice that you palpate a thyroid nodule, but when you do uh, T4s on them, their T4s are totally normal. What we know about those cats is that those cats develop the nodules first. They eventually will become hyperthyroid. Some other event will occur that will cause that non-functional nodule to become a hyperfunctioning nodule. And the things that we think trip that nodule to becoming hyperfunctional, uh, one of them is environmental issues. And the main environmental things that are being looked at, uh, one are PPDEs, which are used in the manufacturing of things like uh, flame retardants. And flame retardants are everywhere. They're in carpeting, drapery, bedding, clothing, uh, where they're used obviously as a flame retardant. But what PPDs do is that if you take these chemicals and you put them on uh, thyroid follicular cells in culture, they proliferate. So they're goitrogenic. They cause thyroid cells to grow. And again, what we're thinking is that these class of compounds, in addition to being uh, goitrogenic in the cats, predispose them on top of having this goiter to eventually developing a clone of those cells that becomes hyperfunctional and makes the cat uh, go off and become hyperthyroid. Now, if you look at large studies on epidemiology with large numbers of cats, there are studies from the East Coast, the West Coast, from Europe and Australia, and they pretty much all uh, show the same things. One is, is that hyperthyroidism is a disease of older cats. And I think this primarily happens for two reasons, is that prior to 1979, prior to the advent of the feline leukemia vaccine, Cats didn't live to be that long. Outdoor cats died of viruses or got hit by cars. Indoor cats weren't living as long, um, primarily because of routine health care as well as nutrition. So what we've seen is a cat population getting older, and as that population is getting older, their risk factors for exposures to things that might make them hyperthyroid has gone up. So increasing age is definitely a factor. Uh, Non-purebred cats are overrepresented in all the studies. So it looks like something in purebred cats is protective of hyperthyroidism, whether it's these genetic factors or the way they deal with environmental factors. Use of a litter box increases the likelihood of becoming hyperthyroid. Um, and this is kind of a, of a strange thing. At first, people thought, well, uh, cats that are using litter boxes are probably indoor cats. Indoor cats are probably living longer than outdoor cats. Therefore, it may not be the fact that it's using a litter box. It's just that it's getting older. But when you look at the data and dissect it down more, that doesn't seem to have anything to do with it. 
And it doesn't seem to matter what type of litter the cats use, whether it's clay litter, clumpable litter. Um, it looks like there are chemical constituents within cat litter that are probably goitrogenic. Again, whether it's something like flame retardant chemicals or plasticizers uh, that are used, uh, but there's something in the litter that predisposes them. If we look at diet, what we know is cats that take in more than 50% of their calories as wet food have an increased risk, especially cats that have their wet food come in the form of a pop-top can. And the pop-top can is basically what happens is that the reason it's a pop-top and you peel it back and you hear that noise is because of the plasticizing agent that's used to make the pop-top can open. And those plasticizers contain substances that are known to be goitrogenic. And so what's probably happened again is that as these cats eat more and more wet food that's involved with these plasticizers, the plasticizer leaches into the food and as a result of that, the cats get exposed uh, to the levels of these agents. It's very unlikely that the pop-top can is gonna go away um, because it's so, uh, it has pretty much changed the packing industry in terms, and this is in humans as well, uh, these substances are present in uh, the canning industry on the human side. And there's a whole body of literature uh, on these types of agents, environmental and dietary, that are called endocrine disruptors. Uh, and if you go to the, uh, the Society of Clinical Endocrinology, the human organization, you can download their manuscript on uh, environmental uh, endocrine disruptors and the list of chemicals that are in the environment that are known to adversely affect uh, endocrine function, whether it's pituitary, uh, thyroid, ovarian, testicular. Uh, and actually, you shouldn't download it and read it. Um, it's actually kind of disturbing. Uh, but plastics, plasticizing agents are definitely in there. The other risk factor is exposure to fish. Uh, cats that eat uh, more fish than less fish have an increased risk of hyperthyroidism. We don't necessarily know exactly what this is about, although I suspect that what it's related to is the amount of iodine that's in the fish. And so when it says fish, when you walk up and down the grocery store aisle and it says fish flavored food, I don't know if you ever stop to think about what in the hell does that mean? I mean, I grew up in the Midwest. I figured out there was more than one kind of fish a long time ago. And so what basically they do is they get whatever source of fish protein is the cheapest during that particular run for that particular food. And so it could be white meat fish, red meat fish, freshwater fish, saltwater fish, all of which have different levels of dietary iodine. And we think that one of the things that may be happening is that these cats, they're becoming older, they're getting a goiter, they're being exposed to goitrogenic substances, then they ingest food not with high or low levels of iodine, but with fluctuating levels of iodine. And that's what the thyroid doesn't like. If you ingest a constantly low level, it knows what to do. If you ingest a constantly high level, it knows what to do. But when you ingest fluctuating levels of iodine, it, it, it has a hard time with that. So it may be that one of the triggers for uh, hyperthyroidism in cats is all of those things plus being exposed to uh, differential uh, levels of iodine in the diet. Now, the other thing that we've noticed about the disease is that, that like that slideshow, that cat was crazy affected by hyperthyroidism. And when the first papers came out, these cats were really messed up. They were severely emaciated, PUPD, polyphagic, a lot of heart disease, a lot of, a lot of thyrotoxic heart disease, hypertrophic changes, a lot of arrhythmias, and a lot of the cats died as a result of this. And when they first figured out that these cats had that particular constellation of symptoms, and they had thyroid abnormalities on histopath. Uh, Mark Peterson was working with uh, some human physicians in New York, and the human physician said, well, what's their thyroid function like that looks like they have a disease that we see in people called toxic multinodular goiter? And prior to that, no one was running thyroid levels on cats because no one thought hypothyroidism occurred in the cat. So what they found is that these cats all had a high, really, really high levels of total T4, they scanned them uh, with technesium, found that they had thyroid abnormalities, and then we started to treat cats with surgery, radioactive iodine, and antithyroid drugs. And what we see now, largely because we screen cats now, uh, we find cats way earlier in the disease process than we used to. So what we tend to see now are cats who don't have much cardiac disease, but tend to have more GI signs, which tend to be fairly mild, or, again, they, we have a larger population of cats that are just simply asymptomatic, that they're not showing any symptoms at all. 
On physical exam, you should be able to palpate a thyroid nodule in virtually every hyperthyroid cat. The exception would be the rare cat that has ectopic disease. Um, so they actually have thyroid tissue uh, from the base of their tongue to the base of their heart. So you'll occasionally see cats with ectopic disease, won't have a thyroid nodule, um, but if you do a thyroid scan on them, you'll see uptake uh, either in the mouth or uh, in the thoracic cavity. Their PUPD, hyperthyroidism raises metabolic rate, increases GFR, increases renal blood flow. So um, you're going to see uh, polyuria and a secondary polydipsia. Certainly they'll be losing weight from the catabolic effects of being hypermetabolic. And then a lot of cats now, one of the common symptoms that we see are owners complaining of behavioral signs. They're pacing around at night, they're howling at night, um, they're having litter box issues. Um, they may still defecate in the litter box, uh, but they're not wanting to urinate in the litter box, probably because they know there's goitrogenic substances uh, in, their, in their litter. So when we're diagnosing hyperthyroidism, it's a lot easier to diagnose hyperthyroidism uh, than it is to diagnose hypothyroidism. Um, but these are old cats, and so we want to make sure that in addition to just looking at their thyroid function, we want to evaluate all the cat, the entire cat, because there may be other geriatric diseases going on that could adversely affect thyroid function testing or that are going to affect what we're going to recommend for treatment options uh, in treating these cats. So we want to get a good history about what else is going on with them, what medications are they taking, um, and then do a good physical exam. And when we go to the database, we're going to look again at doing a complete database, CBC, CHEM, uh, UA, uh, thoracic radiographs. If you hear something on auscultation, you're picking up a murmur, arrhythmia, you're, you're picking up a gallop, uh, you want to look at the cardiac silhouette and the pulmonary vasculature. <coughs> EKGs. I'm an internist. I can't read a CAT EKG to save my life. They look very weird uh, normally. Um, and when I was an intern at Purdue, um, I, was, I was very ADD, I guess. I don't know what they knew. They didn't have that word back then. They just, they just didn't like me. And so one of the things that we did, um, that I did, I take full responsibility for it, is that at Purdue at the time we had a technician school attached to the veterinary hospital. And we had all these technicians running around 24 hours a day. It was phenomenal. And so what we did one evening is that um, Purdue was in the process of working on validating trans-telephonic EKGs for CardioPet. And so our mission as interns were every cardiac patient we had, we had to do this trans-telephonic EKG. Well, one night when I was on emergency and quite bored, I decided to hook up six dead animals to trans-telephonic EKGs and transmitted that information to CardioPet. And got back reports that said three of them needed to be on a beta blocker. I immediately became very dubious of the whole trans-telephonic EKG business. And I thought I had created, uh, had done quite a little study in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to me, the developer of the trans-telephonic EKG was one of the professors at Purdue. And every morning he would get a report saying these are the reports that came, these are the cases that came in and where they were coming from and blah, blah, blah. So I go marching into rounds feeling quite good about myself only to have Dr. Weirich say, um, where are the six animals that you did EKGs on? And I immediately knew I was completely screwed. And you know, I said, well, they're, they're very stable at the moment, um, and you know, they're dead, and we don't really need to talk about them. And he goes, oh yes, we do need to talk about them. And I was strongly encouraged to pursue alternative career paths um, at Purdue. And since Weirich was a surgeon, my career as a surgeon pretty much ended, and I moved over to medicine. So CAT EKGs, I don't know, it's, it's difficult. When looking at thyroid function testing in cats to diagnose hyperthyroidism, the good news is, is that 94% you know, of cats have the decency to have an elevated total T4. So you know, the diagnostic approach is, is simpler than with hypo. We pretty much just will start with a total T4 test and then only have to look at these other tests if we're running into a cat where the total T4 comes back normal, but we have a strong index of suspicion that the cat's hypothyroid. It's got a palpable nodule and it has clinical signs. Now we really don't look at total T3 testing because T3 doesn't really help us um, because most of T3 is actually intracellular, not floating around the blood. So the test we primarily do now is the free T4 um, by dialysis. We used to do TRH stims and T3 suppression tests uh, prior to the uh, free T4 test. They work, and they actually work pretty well. The problem is 
Uh, TRH stimulation tests in cats are expensive, and TRH is a uh, pucogenic substance in the cat. It's a reliable way to make a cat vomit. T3 suppression works too, but the problem with that is that the owner has to give T3 orally to the cat every eight hours for two and a half days. And so if they fail to suppress, our, one of the rule outs is they just never got the T3. And so um, that's sort of an issue. And then for cats where at the end of the day we're not sure, even looking at total and free T4, then we scan them. And technesium is actually a very sensitive way of picking up hyperthyroidism because <laughs> what you're basically looking for is asymmetry. Is there a difference between the left and the right thyroid gland? Now, when we look at uh, total T4 testing, if we look at in cats with hyperthyroidism, what we see is that the specificity is 100%. So any cat with an elevated total T4 is hyperthyroid. The problem with total T4 testing is sensitivity is only 91%. So what that tells us is that 9% of hyperthyroid cats are running around out there with a normal total T4. Now, how is it that their hyperthyroid, their clinical signs are due to hyperthyroidism, yet their total T4s are normal? The reason is, is that those are hyperthyroid cats that are also have another illness. They have a concurrent disease. And that concurrent disease is of sufficient magnitude that it's altering the affinity of T4 for binding proteins or altering the concentration of the proteins that bind T4 in the blood. So what that does is it brings the total T4 concentration uh, down into the reference range. If we look at free T4 testing by dialysis, and basically with dialysis what we do is we dialyze the sample so there is no protein in it, so there are no matrix effects going on. What we see is that the sensitivities improve from 91 to 99 percent, which is excellent, but the false positive rate goes to 6 percent. And the reason is is that 6 percent of older cats, older euthyroid cats, have a free T4 by dialysis that's above the reference range, and they're completely normal. And we're not sure what this is. We think that this has something to do with uh, something in the plasma of some older cats, whether it's a fatty acid or some other substance, that's interfering with the method that we use to measure free T4. And so what this tells us is, is that in screening a cat for hyperthyroidism, we don't want to screen with a free T4. Even though it's more sensitive, because it's less specific, uh, what you want to do is start with a total T4 and then go to a free T4 by dialysis if that total T4 comes back in the reference range. And in fact, what we really want to do is look at only the population of cats where the total T4 is in the upper 50% of the reference range. So for instance, at our lab, our reference range goes from 1 to 4 uh, micrograms per deciliter. So we did a study with 2,700 cats looking at uh, normal cats, sick cats, and cats with hyperthyroidism. And what we found is that if you had a total T4 greater than 4, the cat was hyperthyroid. If you had a total T4 of less than 2.5, the cat was euthyroid. But if you had a cat with a total T4 between 2.5 and 4.0, those are the cats that you want to do a free T4 by dialysis on because those are the cats where non-thyroidal illness may be sufficient enough to bring that total down into the reference range. And so those are the group of cats that benefit from a free T4. So if you submit a T4 to the lab and it comes back in the upper 50% of the reference range, I would call the lab and say, hey, can you add on a free T4 by dialysis? Um, and they should be able to do that. So the free T4 testing combined with total pretty much has gotten rid of the need to do any of those other weird tests. I'd also say that with respect to free T4 testing, at least at Antec, is that you need to order it within the first 24 hours because free T4 degrades. And so um, if you, it wouldn't be something where if you, got, you know, if you didn't want to order or didn't think to order the free T4 until three days later, you're going to have to submit another blood sample. Um, but if it's within uh, 24 hours, we can probably run it on the sample that you originally submitted. Yeah. Isn't Antec running their free T4s you know, two or three times a week? Uh, we run them every day. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. We run the dialysis free T4s every day. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah, that gets run. Uh, I shouldn't say every day, Monday through Saturday. Uh, well, maybe that's not true. Where do you live? Maryland. Hmm. I can only tell you on the West Coast we run them that often. So you may have to check because I think most of your free T4s are being run in Long Island. I thought they were being run twice a week, which is why 
we don't get them back in a consistent uh, That's not good. They take two days. Yeah, the test itself takes 24 hours. So it would be, but I think they're set up, at least on the West Coast, we set them up every day. But yeah, you, it would take more than 24 hours to get the result back just because the dialysis step takes a long time. Yeah, so I'd call the lab in Long, or call Rhett Nichols and ask him how often they run the test because he should know. If he doesn't know, then I'll yell at him because he should know. <laughs> in California, we run them every day. Now, in terms of treatment options, the good news is you have options and the bad news is you have options. Um, you know, I've, I've always liked diseases for which you only have one choice because that makes life really simple. It keeps owners from getting confused. But when we sit there and talk to an owner about what their options are, the things that we have a conversation about is, well, how messed up is the cat? You know, what other diseases does the cat have that may impact uh, the hyperthyroidism or the medication? The owners, of course, are very concerned about cost. Well, you know, what's it going to cost? And one of the things that they overlook is they may look at surgery versus radioactive iodine versus oral topical medication and immediately migrate to the medications because they think they're cheaper. The reality is, though, is that hopefully their cat's going to live for a while with this disease. And the longer they live means the longer they're on drug and the more monitoring that's involved. And so there used to be a commercial on TV. I think it was for a car for oil filters or something. And it said, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. That's the beauty of hyperthyroidism in the cat. So they can either spend the money up front to do something definitive or they can spend the money uh, over time if they want to go uh, oral topical. Um, it also involves an owner who can chronically give medication. Um, some owners will go home with the tapazole on day one, think life is great, and on day two they realize that's not going to happen. Um, then they also have to worry about long-term medication when they're out of town, who's going to do it, uh, what if the cat gets sick, can't take oral medications. Uh, the availability of radioactive iodine. You know, used to be, so how many people, let me just ask, how many people if you had a newly diagnosed hyperthyroid cat, the fir your first recommendation would be uh, radioactive iodine? How many people would be medication? How many people would be surgery? Okay. Um, you know, the radioactive iodine issue, I don't know what, what's the average cost for iodine around here? Is it all over the place? 1200 1200 bucks? Okay. That's kind of what the average is. They're doing a scan as well as giving them radioactive iodine, like there's a technetium scan and then treatment? Okay. Um, that's kind of average throughout the country. You know, if they're just doing I-131 and they're not scanning them first, um, it's probably going to be a little bit cheaper than that, but, you know, 1200 bucks is kind of average. The availability of iodine now has gotten greater and greater as people have figured out the, uh, the reality of radioactive iodine, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the safety issues and stuff. And then surgery, surgery is certainly an option. I mean, surgery is very safe, it's very effective. Um, our problem with surgery in our hospital is that I have five surgeons uh, all boarded, none of whom have ever done a thyroidectomy in a cat. They've never even seen a thyroidectomy in a cat. They can take a tumor out of your brain stem but they can't take a cat thyroid tumor. They go, oh, dear God, I can't do that. And I go, what the hell are you talking about? You know, you can do that. The problem is they just were never exposed to it because in most of the places where they train, they got radioactive iodine. So surgical experience, if you're, whether you're doing unilateral or bilateral, whether you're doing staged or unstaged, whether you're doing intracapsular or extracapsular, um, surgery is certainly a way to go. It's the only caveat to surgery is you want them to go to surgery, you thyroid. So, you know, they're going to go to surgery after they've been on uh, medication first so that we can get uh, things under control. Medically, we have choices as well. We can use uh, tapazole orally or topically. Uh, we can use carbimazole, uh, which is a prodrug that is metabolized to methimazole in the body. The advantages of things like uh, carbimazole in theory, which hopefully will be available here in the U.S. soon, is that carbimazole appears to have fewer GI side effects than the tapazole. So once it gets through the GI tract and into the liver and converted to methimazole, the GI side effects uh, seem to be better. And also there's a form of carbimazole that's a long-acting form uh, that can be given every other day uh, to cats with hyperthyroidism. So that may be an option. Um, sodium ipidate and iothanoic acid we've rarely used in cats. These are basically iodine-containing compounds that block the synthesis of uh, T4 in cats, but they really didn't work very well for long-term treatment, and they didn't work very well in cats with total T4s that were greater than 12. 
um, it didn't seem like you could give them enough of the drug to get their thyroid levels down. Now remember tapazole, um, the way that it works is it blocks the formation of total T4. But cats who are hyperthyroid have a lot of T4 that's already been manufactured and is sitting in their thyroid cells. And so it takes about 7 to 14 days before you see the total T4 normalize in a lot of cats. Um, you can use it short term, you can use it chronically. Um, and also now there's several papers looking at its application uh, using it topically. Most compounding pharmacies now use the same carrier, uh, the same PLO gel, so we're getting uh, fairly consistent results uh, no matter where you're getting the compounded medication. What we have seen is that the dose of tapazole over time has gotten lower. You know, in the early 80s, we were tending to use 5 milligrams, 7.5 milligrams, 10 milligrams twice a day. But that's because we were dealing with really screwed up cats with really high T4s. Now we're starting most cats at 2.5 milligrams twice a day, um, going up if we need to, but usually starting out at 2.5 twice a day. You do have to start BID. Uh, three or four papers now showing that you're going to get much better control, more rapid control with BID dosing than SID dosing. But once you get the cat's youth thyroid, if you want to make it easier for the owner and you want to go from twice a day to once, you can probably get away with that. Um, but probably to get them down and get them controlled initially, you'll probably have to go BID. And we usually bring them back a seven days later to measure total T4 and also bring them back to measure their BUN and creatinine because for the reasons that we're going to talk about later, the thing that we're concerned about is a decline in renal function uh, as we bring the total T4 down into the normal range. Now, tapazole does have side effects, the most common of which uh, are GI, uh, so vomiting, diarrhea, and appetence. Uh, the good news about the GI side effects is that they're usually uh, dose-dependent. So you stop the medication, cat feels better, start them at a lower dose, and slowly titrate the dose of the tapazole until you get control. The less common side effects are the more significant for the cat. Uh, the hematologic side effects... This is primarily going to be lymphocytosis and eosinophilia, which is just a sign of immune stimulation in the cat. But the thing that we're most worried about is neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. And if you see that in a cat, you have to stop the drug. Uh, that's an idiosyncratic reaction. We can't give them oral topical tapazole after that. They're going to have to go to something else. And then the least common side effect is probably the worst one, and that's hepatotoxicity with tapazole. So a lot of your cats, you probably notice, have mild increases in liver enzymes pre-treatment. Most of those resolve. But if you notice that a cat's uh, ALT and bilirubin and alphos are going up when they're on tapazole, they need to come off because it can cause uh, acute hepatic necrosis. And if that's occurring, again, that's an idiosyncratic, not uh, dose-dependent thing. You need to stop the drug uh, and go to plan B for that cat. Long-term management is certainly possible. I mean, if the cat's doing well on tapazole, orally or topically, uh, there's no reason why they can't use that as their sole uh, method of treatment. What we usually recommend doing is that they have uh, T4, CBC, and chemistry uh, every three to six months. And we like to do it every six months anyway because they're older cats. Um, primarily, we're looking not just at their thyroid state at that point, but we're also looking at them because they're geriatric cats and we want to know if anything else is going to pop up on them. Like we said, topical has been shown to be uh, quite efficacious. Uh, a couple of caveats to topical uh, treatment. Probably the main one is, is that, uh, oh, well, there are several. One is owners have to be reminded constantly. It has to go to the non-haired part of the ear. Uh, the number of cats we see where the stuff is caked on the outer part of the pinna is crazy. Um, they need to clean the ears uh, because continually to apply that stuff to the inside of the ear results in accumulation of, of the PLO gel and there's no drug then able to get through. Uh, they need to wear finger protection when they're putting that stuff on because they're being exposed uh, to the oral topical medication. Um, so we don't want them to do that as well. And what we've sort of seen is that the dose, we use the same dose, two and a half milligrams twice a day. But in general, your average cat probably needs a little bit more tapazole when given transdermally than given orally. Um, because likely it's just better absorbed through the GI tract than it is uh, through the skin. As we said, carbimazole uh, has been shown uh, to be converted to methimazole, uh, less GI side effects in Europe where it was approved for use first. It's either used uh, by itself or in some hyperthyroid cats they'll use it in conjunction with a beta blocker 
Um, they're using the beta blocker to deal with the sympathetic effects of hyperthyroidism. Not yet available in the U.S., but we're certainly hopeful that it'll be available soon. In the studies that were done, uh, and we participated in these uh, studies, uh, it was a one-year study. Uh, most cats took anywhere between 10 and 15 milligrams once a day. Uh, clinical signs improved within three weeks, so very similar to tapazole. 25% uh, did have an uh, increase in BUN, which is very consistent with what we see with uh, tapazole, radioactive iodine, and surgery. And we did see eosinophilia in 20%, and that's also consistent with what we saw with tapazole. And again, I don't think the eosinophilia is a reason to stop the drug, uh, as long as they're not developing neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Now, the beauty of radioactive iodine is that we describe it to owners as uh, it's like a laxative. It's simple, safe, and effective, just like x uh, Greater availability, basically no side effects uh, because of the way the isotope works. Uh, we do have owners, especially in California, who don't want to do radioactive iodine because they say, oh, it's not natural. You know, I don't want to do that. Do we have other choices? To which I give them the following uh, story about radiation, and that is, you know, there's nothing more natural on the face of the planet than radioactive decay. And in fact, it's how we carbon date dinosaurs and the redwoods and everything out there is giving off radiation. It's a wonderful thing. And they say, oh, that's fantastic. I want my cat to be like a redwood. What I, what I don't tell them is, is that where we get the I-131 is from the local nuclear reactor. I don't bother to bring that into it. They think there's a tree out there exuding I-131, in which case, you know, they're all for it. The way that it, it works is that you need iodine to make thyroid hormone. The radioactive iodine is taken up by the thyroid follicular cells. The radioactive iodine emits two particles. It emits a gamma particle, which is what we use for imaging uh, with a gamma camera doesn't have any toxicity, and it emits a beta particle which travels about one to two millimeters through tissue and is lethal to anything it comes into contact with. So it's the beta particle emission that is the uh, ingredient that kills the thyroid cells. And the nice thing about it is, is that I-131 is only taken up by thyroid cells that are hyperactive. So any normal thyroid tissue in that cat will be suppressed by the hyperactive cells won't take up the iodine and therefore will survive the I-131. And because of that, that's why the incidence of hypothyroidism is exceedingly low after I-131, because you just can't ablate cells that aren't picking up uh, the radiation. Uh, most facilities that are doing radioactive iodine give anywhere between one to five millicuries. The average is probably around three millicuries. Um, if we suspect the thyroid carcinoma based on scintigraphy, um, weird uptake patterns in the neck or obvious spread to the chest or to lymph nodes, um, then we're probably going to give cats 10 or 15 millicuries of I-131. Depending on where, where you guys are and what the requirements are, uh, the amount of time the cat has to spend in isolation is variable. Um, in California, we keep the cats for three days. Uh, so they come in on Tuesday, they go home on Friday. Kind of depends how long do you guys, is that about the same? Two weeks? Two days. Oh, two days. Oh, good. Yeah, two days. It's very reasonable. The, the reality is in people is that if you had hyperthyroidism, either Graves or toxic multinodular goiter, um, you'd go into the endocrinologist, go to the radio pharmacist. They'd give you 30 millicuries of I-131 and you drink it and go home. Uh, what they assume you're going to do is not urinate in random places in your house um, and that you're not going to do anything else that would be uh, kind of bizarre. Um, what the agencies are always paranoid about is the cat that's going to go home and you know, lay on the neck of a newborn. I mean, that's kind of like the worst case scenario. Um, and they also usually tell you to limit contact with your cat for two weeks and you know, do all kinds of weird stuff with the litter. It's virtually goofy. 48 hours after the I-131, there's essentially no iodine in urine, feces, or uh, saliva. Efficacy is crazy good, greater than 95%. And then this is where things all go downhill, where pet owners are, just don't get a, have a clue, is that they'll say, I don't like to use, I don't want to use radioactive iodine. So, okay, what, it's not natural? And they say, oh, no, we're, we're comfortable with that. It's because it kills cats. And I said, that's right, I'm a vet. My job is to kill your cat. I'm just going to kill it really slowly with radiation. And I said, well, why do you think it kills cats? And they all go to the Internet and they find this paper. And the paper says that the median survival of cats treated with radioactive iodine is two years. 
And if you look at the percentage of cats alive at one, two, and three years, it drops to 50% at three years. Now they look at that and they go, well, I don't want my cat to only live two years. And I said, well, I agree. No one wants your cat to live for two years. When they look, what they don't know, again, when they look at the studies, that the average age of the cats was almost 15. <laughs> they didn't die of radiation. They didn't die of hyperthyroidism. They died because they were old cats. And 50% of 18-year-old cats are dead, unless you have a Siamese cat, you know, in which case they live forever. You know, because everybody knows that Siamese cats live to be about 40 years old. You know, they weigh about two pounds. They defecate once a month. They eat sporadically, and then one day they're just gone. So other cats are, aren't going to live that long, but <coughs> Siamese cats may live a good long time. So we tell them, your cat, the median survival of two years is highly dependent on the age of your cat. The other thing I do warn them about is that if we're treating an eight-year-old cat for hyperthyroidism, I warn them that there's a good chance you'll be bad. Um, if your cat lives to be 16 or 17, chances are he's going to be back in here because whatever it was, the major cat hyperthyroid in eight years is still here. And so if your cat lives eight more years, um, then we may be back and visiting the same issue again. Incidence, we said of hypothyroidism is very low um, because of ectopic uh, tissue. Usually what happens is that you'll notice their total T4s will be low for about two to four months post-treatment, and then they'll start to come back up. And one of the things as well with radioactive iodine is that depending on who is doing the radioactive iodine, there may be different requirements for when they want you to stop oral or topical antithyroid meds and whether or not uh, when they want you to stop using the iodine-restricted diet like YD. So I would just check with the facility uh, beforehand to find out uh, what they're doing. Monitoring the cat's act of radioactive iodine. At one month, we're looking for low. Uh, all the cats after iodine should be normal or low at one month. If they're not, then they failed treatment and they need to be redosed. We're looking at three and six months to make sure that the cat's now back to normal. And then we're going to test them every year after that uh, to look for recurrence. They should have blood tests every six months just because they're old cats. And I would wait on treating a cat for hypothyroidism after I-131 for at least four months. Um, because most cats that are hypothyroid, the owners has a hard time picking up on that anyway. They may be gaining some weight, which we want them to do. They may be a little bit more lethargic. Uh, the main symptom of hypothyroidism in a cat after I-131 is constipation. So if they are starting to develop colonic motility issues and their T4 is low and they're out more than three or four months, I would probably go ahead and supplement that cat. But one of the reasons why an owner probably chose radioactive iodine was because they didn't want to pill their cat. So we're going to try and wait uh, and see if thyroid function recurs. Now, another issue that, that came up recently was the issue of, you know, should we be scanning every single hyperthyroid cat or as long as their T4s are elevated and they have a nodule, can we just irradiate them? And this was a paper that showed that 20% of cats, and this was in 120 cats, had ectopic tissue. And the problem with that is, is that these cats would have failed a fixed dose iodine regimen. So ideally, um, depending again on where you're located, I would probably opt to send the cats uh, to some place where they can not only do I-131, but they can uh, do technesium scans on all the cats. Okay, let's talk about the food. So iodine, as far as we know, the only uh, role of iodine in the body is to make thyroid hormone. So your uh, thyroid cells pull iodine out of the blood uh, through an iodide trap, incorporate it onto the colloid of the thyroid follicular cells where it iodinates tyrosine residues. And these iodinated tyrosine residues form, get together and form T3 and T4 and then get secreted out into the blood. So again, Nockreiner's goal was, well, what level of dietary iodine can we feed cats and prevent them from becoming hyperthyroid? The first issue came up is, what is the minimum iodine requirement for a cat? And there were two things out there that were conflicting. One was the NRC, which is the Nutrition Research Council recommendation for cats, that said that the iodine requirement uh, was 1.4 parts per million. Now, that number uh, regrettably came from a, a paper that I wrote that had nothing to do with the iodine requirement of a cat. So therefore, it made total sense that that's what they used it for. It was a study where we were looking at iodine turnover in cats prior to I-131. The AFCO study was the, this is the body that certifies uh, ingredients in cat food and dog food. And they came up with a value of 0.35 parts per million. And when we asked them, well, where did you get that? Because, you know, we're trying to find the studies. They said, oh, well, we got it from pigs. And that was the pig requirement. And they assumed pig and cat, they're pretty similar. 
Uh, therefore, pig and cat um, should have the same iodine requirement. So that was sort of preposterous. So Karen Wiedekin, who was a nutritionist at Hills at the time, um, said, well, we need to know, so we're going to have to do the study. So they took cats and followed them for one year, exposed them to different levels of dietary iodine, and looked at lab testing, clinical science, thyroid function testing, thyroid scintigraphy, and basically found that the minimum iodine requirement for cats was about 0.46 parts per million, and iodine deficiency occurs at levels of less than 0.15 to 0.17 parts per million. So what they started to do at Hills then was to uh, conduct feeding trials taking cats who were spontaneously hyperthyroid in their colony, because the, they had normal cats that just lived out their life there, and they took these hyperthyroid cats and switched them from an adult maintenance uh, feline diet, which was at about 1.2 parts per million, and started feeding them diets that were lower and lower in iodine. And what they found was that at 0.47 parts per million, some of the cats normalized. At 0.28, almost all the cats normalized. And at 0.17, they all normalized. And then they took those same cats that they had made normal and they refed them up to 0.47 parts per million, and uh, about 30% of the cats became hyperthyroid again. And they took another group of cats and fed them at 0.39 parts per million, and 20% of the cats became hyperthyroid again. And they took the last group of cats and put them at 0.28 parts per million, both newly diagnosed cats and uh, hyperthyroid cats that were previously controlled at 0.17, and they all stayed normal on the diet. So they came up that the target iodine concentration in the food should be above 0.17 and less than 0.3 parts per million. And that's what the current diet is, both the canned uh, and the dry formulations. They also did studies looking at hyperthyroid cats, um, feeding them at 0.17 parts per million, then raising their dose or raising the iodine back up to 0.19 while leaving part of the cats at 0.17 and then decreasing them down again to 0.32. And basically what they found again is that if you keep them between 0.37 and 0.3, that that's the uh, amount of iodine that will restore and keep cats uh, hypothyroid or euthyroid. If we look at serum total T4 concentrations uh, throughout these studies, again looking at about 0.3 parts per million, uh, their total T4s uh, stay normal. And we can bring down elevated total T4s in cats Again, this is looking at uh, concentrations of 0.3 parts per million. We were very interested in what happened to the cat's TSH levels because one of our concerns was is that if we were iodine restricting them too much, that their TSH levels in their blood would go up and TSH would cause thyroid cells to grow. And what they found again is that uh, whether they were on 0.7 or 0.32 parts per million, serum TSH levels didn't rise which means that their free T4 concentrations were not going low. And all of the studies that they looked at, CBC, chemistry panels, um, body weights, thyroid weights, scanning, everything else looked uh, stable. They didn't see any abnormality. So how efficacious then is the food relative to uh, other treatment modalities? So if we look at all the studies combined looking at surgery, it's about 92%. The reason it's not 100% are in the studies where they did not do a bilateral thyroidectomy and the cats had bilateral disease. Uh, radioactive iodine, 94 to 95%. Antithyroid drugs have the lowest efficacy, probably, and, and these are cats that are being pilled. These aren't because the owners stopped giving the meds. Probably because of problems with absorption or side effects with the medication. And if we look at all of the cats that have been treated with YD, uh, we're looking at probably about 90%, which is what we've been seeing uh, in our practice. The other thing we wanted to know is we, we always recommended for cats taking uh, oral topical medication that the goal was to get their total T4 between uh, 1 and 2.5. We don't need it to be low and we don't want it to be above 2.5 because above 2.5 their free T4s might be elevated. So this is a, a compilation looking at cats treated with either surgery, oral topical medication, or I-131, and 43% of the cats had a total T4 of less than 2.5, but 57% of the cats had a total T4 between uh, 2.5 and 4. And when we look at the cats on YD, 88% of the cats, um, and that should say 190, not 19, uh, but 190 cats, the 88% of them had a total T4 concentration of less than 2.5. 
This is another paper looking at uh, the carbimazole study just as it relates to uh, oral carbimazole versus transdermal methimazole uh, versus what we see on YD. Uh, the oral carbimazole, again, uh, seems to be just as efficacious uh, as the transdermal methimazole or oral methimazole, but again, side effects uh, are going to be lower. Now, one of the interesting things is if you go into a pet store or grocery store and you pull cat food off the shelf and you look at how much iodine's in there, 0.3 parts per million uh, doesn't happen in the grocery store. So unfortunately, the only diets that we know of that are iodine restricted uh, at the moment are going to be the diet that is coming from hills. So we're going to skip this for a second, come back. To it. What we have seen in some of our cats and in some of the study cats is that there are cats who are persistently hyperthyroid. Uh, even though they're on YD diet. And the number one issue is that they're eating something else. And it looks like if they eat more than a couple of tablespoons a day of some other food substance, that's going to eliminate the positive role of the YD diet restriction. So if they're indoor-outdoor cats and they're eating things, their neighbors are feeding them, um, if the husband is not paying attention, which we had happen a couple of times, that's going to be an issue. Um, we do know that wild mice um, have iodine contents of about 0.3 parts per million. Uh, pet mice, much higher. Um, so pet mice is bad. Uh, wild mice are good. Um, a lot of the holistic treatments for thyroid disease, if they have kelp or seaweed in them, those are crazy high in iodine. So those shouldn't be given. And then any compounded or flavored medication likely has a lot of iodine. So if they have a concurrent illness and are taking a compounded drug, I would say that probably YD is not going to be a good choice for them. Hills has put together a list, and on their website there's a bigger list of medications and treats that we know uh, that have a given iodine content, so we know which things were okay and which things are not okay uh, for cats. And if you go back to their website, you know every month or so you'll see that they've tested something else uh, that an owner has asked about or a vet has asked about. One of the things that we had a problem with was a cat that ate gr uh, indoor grass. Uh, that's, you know, at the grocery store, they bought grass for their cat to feed it. What ends up happening is that the grass is not an issue, but the soil that the grass is in has a lot of iodine. So the cats are being exposed to the iodine that way. So what we want to do is just look at um, what we've been seeing um, in our treated cats, and we'll come back and talk about renal stuff. Well, let's just talk about renal stuff now. One of the issues that we were, were interested in is what happens to hyperthyroid cats that also are azotemic. And when you look at what the role of protein in resolving azotemia and in maintaining lean body mass in cats, there's a lot of studies that have looked at various levels of protein restriction in cats. Now, YD, whether canned or dry, is about 34 to 36%. And so studies have looked at 16% of the calories as protein, uh, 24 and 28 percent of calories is protein, and it looks like in the cat, as long as you're, if you're keeping dietary protein at 24 percent or more, in older cats, whether they have renal disease or not renal disease, they're going to gain weight and preserve lean body mass. But if you get them protein restricted less than 24 percent, you're going to see weight loss and loss of lean body mass. So uh, a lot of the renal diets are formulated um, above 24 percent. And certainly YD is formulated above 24, uh, 24%. It basically started out as a feline senior diet that became an iodine-restricted uh, feline senior diet. So let's just talk about what um, we've seen in our study, which hopefully is here. Um, we're first going to look at some cats that we've seen with azotemia. So we intentionally took azotemic cats. Uh, that were also hyperthyroid. This was the first cat that we treated um, that had a BUN and creatinine of 54 and 3.7. This was a cat that had been on tapazole for a long time, but was one of those cats where one month things were fine and the next month the T4 was really low and we'd adjust the dose and the next time we test it, the cat's T4 would be high. So at the time of his first visit, he was on tapazole. What we recommend doing for cats that were on tapazole is that they cut the dose of tapazole in half, start the food, get the food transitioned over a five to seven day period, and then stop the tapazole completely. And this owner, like all good pet owners, went home and decided to stop the tapazole today and feed my cat YD starting today. So excellent transition, uh, also known as just crazy people. 
So the count came back in uh, about uh, 12 days later. Total T4 had gone up to 7.7 because the cat wasn't on antithyroid drugs anymore. The BUN and creatinine had gone from 48 to 2.2. We continued the cat on the YD diet, and in July um, of that year had a BUN of 39, a creatinine of 2, total T4 of 1.8. cat was doing well, was gaining weight, uh, and looked phenomenal. As a medicine doctor, I thought, well, this is good. Thyroid's normal, azotemia is resolved, cat looks wonderful, life should be good. Called the owner and she said, yeah, no, we have a problem. And I said, okay, well, what's the problem? She says, I talked to the cat last night. And the, no, back up. The cat talked to me last night and said, I want variety. I just don't want to eat a single food. And I said, okay, that's fantastic. Again, you know, and as, as a younger vet, this would have annoyed me, but I said, okay, what do you want to do? She says, well, I, the cat wants to go back on Fancy Feast and wants to go back on Tapazole so he can have an assortment of food. And I said, that's excellent. Let's, let's do that. So uh, we stopped the YD, put the cat back on Fancy Feast, uh, started Tapazole, BUN was uh, 22, the creatinine went up to 2.7. Cat came back in a month later, BUN of 109, creatinine of 6.1, uh, total T4 of 0.9. I said, okay, what does the cat want to do? Uh, maybe the you know, cat should make an informed decision here. Cat apparently decided it wanted to go back on YD, uh, go on IV fluids, get it out of renal failure, so we did that. But then at the end of the, of the time, back in November, the cat's uh, BUN and creatinine never went down to where it was before, um, although we have gotten his total T4 down. So uh, that cat made uh, two really bad decisions about his healthcare manager. <laughs> this cat did much better. Um, again, BUN of 75, creatinine of 4.2. Uh, total T4 of 7, uh, placed the cat on uh, YD, transitioned him over. Um, his total T4 fell down into the reference range by day 22. And then by day 150, the BUN's 34, creatinine's 2.1, uh, total T4 is 1.8. And this has been sort of the pattern that we've seen. Uh, this cat was at 68 and 3.9, uh, total T4 of 7.2. At day 150, at 25, 2.1, and 1.7. So not exactly sure what this is all about because it's, it's not a particularly protein restricted. It's not protein restricted like KD. It's not phosphorus restricted like KD. But there seems to be something going on with the food, which I don't think is simply iodine restriction. I don't think it's because the cat's total T4 is normalized and that's what got rid of their azotemia. So there's a lot of interest now amongst the, the kidney people about what may be going on with the food and starting to look at not only azotemic hyperthyroid cats, but looking at azotemic non-hyperthyroid cats and see what effects uh, the food may have on renal function. So we're continuing to do studies looking at this diet now in cats. Uh, we have now almost 60 cats on food. We have 22 cats where we have data for more than four months. Uh, in these 22 cats, 19 out of the 22 uh, improved clinically and biochemically. Three cats did not become euthyroid. In fact, their T4s didn't really change. In two of those cats, we found that they were being fed food other than YD. Uh, both of these were husbands, uh, by the way, who were involved in them. Uh, one cat, though, as far as we could tell, there was no access to anything uh, that we could determine that had iodine in it, and the cat was only being fed YD. That cat was treated uh, with radioactive iodine, and none of the cats became hypothyroid. So... I think that what we're looking at with the food is that it is certainly another option. Yeah. Um, I've tried the YD a couple times, and it seems like maybe I have 10 cats. I've probably just eight people come back into the cat and eat it. Do would they know? not eat either form of it, or would they just not eat they one? Not eat, according to the owner, they yeah. would not eat either form. So what kind of recommendations do you normally tell the owners when they're trying to, to start? Like, how long do you want them to really give it a go? Because it seems like with the food? Cool. Like, like one cat I have eight, he's not great. But mm -hmm. ones that I well, I mean, I think if they're not eating it, I would tell them that they have to do something else. We've only had a couple of cats that wouldn't eat either canned or dry. We've had many cats that wouldn't eat one or the other, but I've not run into too many cats that wouldn't eat uh, some form of it, especially the, the wet food. Um, but yeah, if they're not eating the food, then they're going to have to get switched um, to something else. So I mean, I wouldn't probably give them more than five or seven days of not wanting to eat. And in the multi-cat household, it becomes an issue because they really cannot eat any other food. And so multi-cat household is going to be tough unless you have an owner who's willing to 
feed all the cats somehow in isolation so that they're not getting into the other animal's diet. What we've been doing with some multi-cat households is if the other cats are normal, is switch everybody to YD. It is a balanced diet. So there's no reason why they can't take the YD. Um, Hills recommends that the non-hyperthyroid cats get a little bit of other food every day. Um, I think that's fine, but I don't see a reason from the long-term feeding trial that you need to do anything. Um, they have data on cats that have been on the food for more than five years. So I don't think a healthy cat eating YD is going to run into any issue. Again, it's not iodine deficient, it's just um, restricted. And then lastly, what do we do with the asymptomatic cats um, that you're finding high T4s and they're otherwise normal? Um, in the past, we would either offer them treatment, but the risk-benefit ratio is more skewed towards risk. The other thing we would do is just watchful waiting, just say, look, these are the signs of hyperthyroidism. If you see those, come back. But that would imply an owner who actually you know, comes back. What we can do now, though, is, is that it'd be reasonable in the asymptomatic, truly uh, hyperthyroid cats that are, have a persistently high T4, is to switch those cats to YD, make sure that their total T4s come back down into normal, and then just maintain them on the diet. Um, and see at what point um, their T4s, as long as they stay normal, then that would probably be reasonable. Okay, does anybody have any questions on anything? Yeah? If you have a cat that's on um, renal diet, is it safe for him to transition onto the YD? Or yeah. The cat? Well, I think if you have a cat who's on a renal diet and his renal disease is doing well uh, on the renal diet, is being cryo interstable. At this point, I would be comfortable switching him as long as the owner's willing to let you monitor kidney function. Because I think based on what we've seen in the azotema cats, it looks like it would be okay. But I would definitely have them come in and monitor the, the cat pretty frequently. Okay. All right. Thank you.